Well, once more, we want to give you a very warm welcome to Salford Community Church uh, on this uh, summer evening. Let's just come and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Merciful Father and gracious Lord, we ask your blessing then upon us. We thank you for the day that you have granted to us, uh, especially that it is the Lord's day in which we can um, dwell and think upon your word and remember uh, once more our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Very conscious, Lord, as we've gathered uh, this evening, uh, for, uh, that we need the Holy Spirit to help us in our worship and to guide us and strengthen us in all that we will be thinking of and dwelling upon and uh, praying about. Oh, Father, uh, may you have the honour and the glory. May Jesus be lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's worship the Lord by reading from his precious word uh, this evening. We're in Philippians chapter 4, and we are reading from verse 8 uh, to the end of uh, the chapter. Okay, right. So Philippians chapter 8, so Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 to the end of the chapter. Uh, I, I think Paul's added a few extra chapters I didn't know about, but it's, it's chapter 4 and uh, verse 8. Uh, let's uh, hear the word of God. Right, Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. <clears throat> and the God of peace will be with you. Now I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and, and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well, uh, that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, <clears throat> no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Uh, the brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. But especially those who are, in the, are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer before we come to the preaching of God's word uh, this evening. Let's pray. We come before you, Lord, as those who need uh, your blessing and your strength to come upon us. We come to the word, O Lord, and pray that your word for your spirit will feed us and strengthen us for the week that is before us. We thank you, Father, that you are 
the God who is so immense. Uh, that, uh, Lord, as we think of the heavens and we think of the, what seems to us to be the infinite uh, uh, scope of the heavens, we realize, oh God, that you are bigger than that because you are the creator. Thank you again for uh, your immensity. Thank you that you always were from the beginning, that you are the self-existing God. We thank you that you're the God of the alls, um, all-powerful, all-knowing, the, the God who is in all places. We thank you, Father, that there is no place where we can call upon you, no pit so deep that we can't cry out in, for help to you in our prayers. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. Thank you that he is the great substitute uh, for us. Uh, we who deserve your wrath and your anger for our sins, Jesus became the sin bearer, the substitute who went uh, and took uh, the things that we uh, deserve upon our, uh, ourselves. He took upon himself and praise you and thank you that because of his righteousness, all who believe in him are clothed in that righteousness too. We thank you that he is our Lord. Thank you that he is our King. And we praise you tonight that he um, prays for us, and prays for his church. And we thank you, Lord, for the great promise still to come that our Lord Jesus Christ will come and with his saints and in power. We thank you. Uh, for God the Holy Spirit as well, and that God the Holy Spirit lives in every true believer, and that he is our guide and our guardian uh, through uh, our lives. And we thank you that his desire and intention is to proclaim the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, uh, dear Father, that through the Holy Spirit we are equipped and enabled uh, to be those proclaimers also. And we thank you that the Holy Spirit is the one who fashions and forms us to be more like our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word and your word being truth. And we thank you that in your word we see Jesus. We see him in all his beauty and splendor and majesty. We see him as the wonderful second person of the Trinity. But we also see him as the lamb that was slain. Thank you for the way that the Bible speaks of the truth, the way whereby we can live and apply what you tell us uh, from your word to our own lives. We thank you, Father, for the truth that is coming from your scriptures that shows us and reveals to us how we should be living our lives. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who applies your word to our hearts and minds. Father, we do also praise you and thank you for the sense of your presence. Lord, may it be that even this evening we might know the sense of your presence with us in this church and in the days that come uh, for us. We need, Lord, a, a touch from you. There are times, Lord, when we confess, perhaps because of the hardness of our own hearts, that you seem very distant from us. But you are always near and it's we, Lord, who are often putting the barriers up between ourselves and yourself. But Lord, we pray that they will be knocked down. We pray, Father, that, that there may be a real uh, touch from you, a real sense of your presence with us, uh, not only in this evening, but day by day, a growing sense that you are near and that to bless. Pray, Lord, for strength from yourself. We, we can do many things, Lord, but when we seek to serve you, when we seek to make the gospel known, we can't do it in our own strength. We are so weak and fragile, such feeble servants, but you give strength to your servants so that we're able uh, to cope and we're able to serve. And so, Lord, we also pray that we might indeed, in this coming week, be those who will serve the Lord by our words and our deeds, and the very things that we 
are able to do, and not only today, but in the days to come, so that, Lord, we can echo the words of Paul as he wrote that letter and say uh, to you and to ourselves, because, Lord, we need to say this sometimes, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, please uh, turn with me then to Philippians uh, chapter 4. And uh, we're only looking at two verses uh, this, this evening. And uh, verse 7, uh, we, haven't, uh, we didn't read it out, but verse 7 tells us about the peace of God. And Paul says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Well, how do we main maintain that peace with God? That's what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening. How to keep that peace of God uh, with us. But there's a word I want to bring uh, to you right at the, uh, the very beginning of our text, verses 8 to 9, and it's that word, finally. Now, we've seen this word a few times in this letter already. Uh, in chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, Paul wrote, finally. And uh, if you were the Philippians at that time, and the first time you'd heard that letter, you might have thought, well, Paul's finishing now his letter. Uh, but he doesn't. He goes on for another chapter and eight verses. Uh, and eventually we get to the final, finally. Uh, and if you read a lot of letters of Paul, you discover that he does this quite often. He seems as if he's finishing, only to launch forth again. Uh, perhaps things have come into his mind. Uh, uh, he's gone off on a little diversion, perhaps, but then he's coming back. And, and this is the final, final uh, uh, finally, uh, that Paul brings to us, because he's closing his letter, as we uh, have seen when we, we've read. So, uh, as we said in the previous verse, Paul told us about peace uh, with God, the, the peace of God which passes all understanding, the peace that believers and only believers have. It's a kind of peace which is in the soul, a peace which comes with knowing that our sins are forgiven, and we have peace with God, and we have our inheritance in the heavens with Jesus. Now, the problems that we have living in our, our lives is often that with the busyness of our lives and the concerns of life and the distractions that come our way, uh, that peace can be something that we can, can lose touch with. Uh, things distress us. Things bubbling up within our hearts sometimes that, that uh, makes us uh, to lose sight of that, uh, that peace with God. And our hearts can grow quite troubled and our minds can lack uh, a peace. So it's good, as Paul is going to bring to us now, it's good to know how we can regain something of that peace of God. And in these verses, verses 8 to 9, Paul is going to be very practical about how we can do that, how we can uh, maintain and keep hold of that peace of God. So the first point would be this, and it comes from the end of verse uh, 8. Meditate. Uh, meditate. Let me uh, throw up the verse uh, for us this evening, where Paul says, Finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, I'm starting at the end of that verse because there is a word of instruction for us from Paul that we should do something. And that doing something is the word meditate. If you uh, used other translations, uh, you would have translations something like this. Think, or dwell, or reflect, or ponder on these things that Paul has listed uh, for us. We'll go through that list in a short while, but I don't want to repeat it again. But uh, it's the idea of uh, thinking deeply, or reflecting, pondering. And uh, I must confess, 
And I don't know if you've ever had this problem, but I remember as a young uh, believer in Jesus uh, that the idea of meditation caused me a lot of problems. Uh, it didn't seem to be the thing that Christians should do. Now, the reason for that is when I became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we had all this sort of Eastern mysticism stuff uh, that was coming in. You know, you had the Beatles, and there was all this transcendental meditation and stuff like that, and you were supposed to sit in a dark corner, and you were supposed to empty your mind and concentrate uh, inside yourself, and perhaps uh, you'd have a, a word that you would keep saying and try to get special breathing techniques and get yourself into some kind of uh, pe peculiar state. Uh, it, and that was the kind of meditation that, that, was, that was around when I became a, a believer. And I can remember quite a few sermons from quite a few preachers who were telling us that we shouldn't meditate. Well, Paul tells us differently, doesn't he? He tells us we should meditate and meditate on God's word. And the difference, really, between Christian meditation and this sort of Eastern mysticism is this. The Eastern mysticism, the Eastern meditation, is all about oneself, uh, going deep inside oneself. Uh, but Christian meditation is all about Jesus. It's all about God, isn't it? It's all about the outside of us. It's the spiritual side of things. And meditating upon that is not ourselves, but him. So <clears throat> meditation then should be, and if we use some of those other words that are used by translation, in, in translations, we should be pondering over God's word. That's quite a nice word. I like that word. Uh, when I think about meditation, I think about going into the scriptures and reading the word of God slowly. Uh, I know sometimes that, that it's good to read quickly through the word of God. Um, and uh, especially if you're a young Christian, it's good to be able to get a, a, a grasp of the whole of Scripture, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, but there are times when you just have to slow down and read the Word of God slowly. Reading the Word, perhaps slowly, verse by verse, and asking questions. Asking questions of uh, the chapter, the verse. Uh, posing questions. What does this verse mean? What do these verses mean? What does this word say? What's this saying about, uh, to me, about my life? What did it say to the Christians that Paul was writing to, uh, for example? Now, Paul here in verse 8 basically gives us a list. list of things. It's not, I, I suggest to you it's not an exhaustive list. It's just a list of things that Paul is thinking. These are good things that we should be meditating upon. And uh, that's the second point uh, that I want to bring to you. Whatever things are. Whatever things are, he says. Well, whatever things are, and he gives us this uh, list, doesn't he? And uh, perhaps what we're going to do, we're going to go uh, through those things uh, uh, bit by bit. Perhaps we, we might say we're going to meditate on these things uh, this evening as we go through them a, a bit more slowly. So whatever uh, things are, and he says, true. So that's the first point. Whatever things are, true. Well, perhaps we need to put, but pose a question. If you're going to meditate on, on, on what Paul is saying about true, you need to ask the question, what is true? Uh, well, uh, who is true could be another question. And of course, the thing is, and what I'm going to be doing this evening is not going into any particular depth here, but really, like Paul, just skimming the surface. Because there's so much here we could, perhaps should, go and meditate quietly by ourselves on. But who is true? Well, God is true, isn't he? God is unchanging. The Bible tells us that. He changes not. God is, a, is often described as a, a rock, a fortress. It's something that's unmovable. Uh, and God is true, and we can think about the, the character of God, can't we? So God is merciful. And that's true. God is gracious. That's true. God is love. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 10, uh, as well. 
uh, God. And all that is true. And so we can reflect upon the nature and the character of God, and we, we can have that confidence that what, it, what the Bible says about God is true, because God is true. We can think about Jesus, can't we? And remember how we mentioned this this morning, but remember how Jesus himself described himself as the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when we read the scriptures and we hear the word of, uh, words of Jesus in the Bible, those words are truth. They're true because Jesus is true. And we can reflect on, on the truth of those words, can't we? I am the resurrection and the life, says Jesus. I am the light of the world, says Jesus. Uh, again, we've already quoted it, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And all those, uh, I'm the good shepherd, we can go through all of those things, and we can sit, and we can think, and meditate, and think that, of the truth of that. Jesus being the good shepherd. And there's the Bible. Well, what did Jesus say about the word of God? Well, he said this, didn't he? Your word, this is, this is John 17, Jesus praying, He's saying to the Father, your word is truth. And the Bible is true. Cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, the word of God is true. It's truth. And when sometimes we have a, 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 dis, a, a disconnect between what people of the world might say or what experts might say or scientists or whatever might say and the word of God, and you have to make a decision, who is true? Well, the Bible is true. God is true. Jesus is true. Scriptures are true. And if there's a difference, well, you go with the Scriptures, don't you? And we can reflect and meditate. We can give thanks and praise to God for, for the very fact that we have a book in our hands that's true. The Scriptures. We don't need somebody else's works. And we don't need, really need somebody else's thoughts. Because all that God will want us to know and, and understand about him and about being believers in Jesus are to be found in his word. Genesis to Revelation. So Paul says, think about this, meditate. Uh, whatever things are true. Uh, that could, that could, uh, we could spend a long time just meditating upon that, couldn't we? Well, uh, Paul's giving us some suggestions here. Uh, so whatever things are, and the next one, noble, he says. Now that word uh, noble, perhaps it's not a word we tend to use very often these days, uh, but it means uh, somebody who's worthy of respect, somebody who's honorable, and uh, or, or something that is um, uh, a noble thing as well. And so when we think, uh, uh, we meditate upon that, perhaps we might think about uh, uh, someone uh, it might be someone in church history it might be someone in the scriptures who we think uh, is noble and we can learn a great deal from them and we need to perhaps meditate upon their lives and the things that they've said well the, obviously the ca obvious candidate for that is Jesus but we can think of Paul uh, we can think of uh, we can think of David perhaps uh, not, don't think about Bathsheba but think of David of the Psalms at this point, and, and, and so on. Or, uh, and we can think uh, of that. Whatever things are honorable, too. Um, so it could be, as we said, Paul. And Paul makes a point of saying to the Philippians in verse 9, we'll get to that uh, in a moment, but in verse 9, he, he tells them to, to think about what he has been to them. And they are to... to Think about and reflect upon his life and ministry there. But it could be something, it could be a thing as well. Something that's honorable, something that's noble. And, uh, well, we could think of portions of scripture perhaps. Psalm 23. That would be a great psalm to, to spend many, many hours in meditation and reflection. But there may be other things uh, as well. Um, the Apostles' Creed. That's a great thing to to meditate upon. Uh, I believe in God the Father, and it goes on like that, doesn't it? And that gives you the whole trinity there. Or perhaps if you want something really meaty, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, 
the, Bapti the, the Baptist Confession of Faith, the Savoy Declaration for the Congregationist. All these are tremendous, uh, uh, honorable, uh, noble documents that we can, can, we can reflect on and meditate on and, and see the great truths that have been given there. So whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, and uh, uh, we could translate that as right, whatever things are right, uh, not wrong, but right. Uh, whatever things are fair, we could say. Uh, we could say it's doing the right things. Meditate upon doing the right things in our lives, or when right things have happened, and we can reflect and meditate and uh, dwell on those things. And, and James gives us a definition of, uh, the, uh, of religion. Uh, that's what he describes it, and he describes it like this in James 1, verse 27. He says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, you can take a verse like that, and for example, you could go to um, the fact that uh, he says, a pure and undefiled religion before God the uh, and the father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. That's a right thing to do. And reflect on that and meditate upon it. And how can I do that? Is there somebody in need in, in the community? Is my neighbor in need? And meditate and reflect. And what you come up with is perhaps an action, uh, something you can do, something that is right to help uh, those uh, people like, like that. So whatever things are uh, true, noble, just. And then he comes up with another one, and that's pure. Uh, pure. Uh, pure as uh, the ribbon snow. <laughs> pure, uh, pure white, we say, don't we? And it's the idea of being unspotted, unblemished. Uh, we can almost say perfect, if you like. But think upon... Uh, uh, upon that. So we, let's go back to one, uh, James chapter 1, verse 27, because I thought that was a, a good text there, because it deals with two points. And there at the beginning, he says, pure and undefiled <coughs> religion before God and the Father is this. And we looked at the orphans and the widows. And then he says, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Keep oneself pure from the contamination of the world. There's a lot of things in the world that can contaminate us, aren't there? And so we need to meditate upon what we do, and perhaps meditate on what we shouldn't do, and perhaps we think, need to think of examples of things which are pure, and reflect on them, and dwell on them, and meditate upon them. And then he comes up uh, with another suggestion about whatever things are lovely. Now, I must admit, that isn't a word I use very often. Lots of people do use the word lovely. But uh, what is lovely? Well, I'm going to give you a kind of definition for myself. It's, it's what delights you. It's what is the light to one's eyes. The, uh, it's whatever sort of makes your heart beat a bit faster be, in, in pleasure. It's whatever... Uh, uh, delights and, uh, and perhaps brings into your mind God-honoring thoughts. So, uh, an, an illustration uh, this evening. Uh, and this is because it's, it's, it's June and uh, it's hot. <laughs> and about this time of year, um, if it wasn't for the COVID-19, I would be probably on my way uh, to Bala. Because at this time of year, at in Bala, they have the Minister's Conference, the Welsh Minister's Conference. You don't have to be Welsh to go there. You just have to realize that it is in Wales. That's why it's called Welsh Minister's Conference. And uh, if you were coming to, uh, to Bala, and uh, as I would have done normally in, in, from Swansea, uh, you would go via Aberystwyth, and uh, you would be get going over the hills, and then you drop down into the town of Bala, which is surrounded by mountains, and as you get over this one very high peak and you come down on the road, 
you get your first glimpse of this lake. And that, for me, is such a joy. Uh, it's such a lovely sight. Now, it's a lovely sight because, well, first of all, it's great beauty. Uh, you can see the mountains. You've got the lake. You've got the, the countryside. You've got these forests there. It's a, it's a delight to the eyes. But it's a delight to me because I start thinking about what God has done in a place, isolated place like Bala, about a man called Thomas Charles of Bala. And I, as we go around the lake and we go uh, in the car past certain villages, you think, well, Thomas Charles preached there. And when Thomas Charles preached in Bala in a time of revival, at the turn of the uh, 1800s, literally hundreds and thousands of people came to faith through his ministry. It was a great time of revival. Uh, when, when Thomas Charles did an open air in Bala, 10,000 people gathered round to hear Thomas Charles preach. If I did an open air in Salford, I'd be, I'd be happy if I had two gathering round to hear me preach. And they're probably from the church. But this was a special time, wasn't it? And I can, as I come down, I see the lake, I'm thinking of these things. God's special blessing in a wonderful way. The Holy Spirit coming down. And then often, after thinking of that, I think about the men who I'm going to be meeting. The men at this conference. 70 or 90 ministers from all over the country. Pastors of churches. Different types of churches. Different sizes of churches but all men of God. And God, God's blessing that the churches were these servants, these men of God, preachers of the gospel, teachers of God's people. I find that lovely. That's my definition of lovely. A delight to the soul, a delight uh, to the heart. But there's other things that are lovely, aren't they? The way that a mother cares for, for, the ba for her baby child. Or the way that a, a son we're trying to be, make sure we're not sexist in all these things, so we're going to add females and males, the way the son would care for his elderly mother. Those things are lovely as well, aren't they? They're a delight to the heart when you see them. And so Paul is telling us to, to, to meditate on these things. Well, let me give you another one before we move into verse 9, and that is of good report. Whatever is of good report. Whatever is commendable, we might say. And we can think again of this kind of way uh, in terms of deeds, the kind of things that people have done, or individuals have done. Uh, uh, what a church, for example, uh, is doing, uh, whether it's able to preach the gospel and able uh, to, to have a concern for the poor and needy of, of society, and reflecting upon that, and how they do it, and can we do a similar thing? And that's meditating on what's being done and doing the right things. Well, those are the list. Like I said, it's not an exhaustive list. We can add other things to it, I'm sure, other things that we can meditate upon uh, in that way. And, uh, and Paul really is just giving us kind of s subtitles. He's expecting us to do the thinking and the meditating uh, on those things. But in verse 9, he, he tells us something different. But it's connected. He says, Paul an example to follow. Paul is putting himself forward as an example to follow. And there we read in verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now we want that God of peace with us, don't we? We want that peace in us. And he's telling us to meditate upon those things, verse 8, but then... And he's a very brave man, if you think about it. He's telling the church at Philippi, think about me. Think what you've seen in me. In fact, he puts it like this. This is a better way of doing it. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. In other words, everything about me. And Paul was there with those people. And they could examine his life, the things that he said, the things that he do, he did. Uh, what he did in private, what he did in public. Uh, he's saying, well, examine this, examine my life. And then he tells them this, these do. Now, that is an incredibly brave 
statement to say, isn't it, uh, what you think about it. It's a wonderful motivation for somebody like Paul uh, to realize that on Monday morning he's got to get up <laughs> and be Paul the Apostle. He can't have a day off being Paul the Apostle because people are looking at him and they're following him and they're seeing him as an example of how it is to be a Christian in the world in which they live. So Paul tells them the things that they ought to be looking at are the things that they would learned from him, that they received from him, they've heard from him, they've seen in him, and they were to do those things. They were to, in a sense, copy him because those were the right things to do. Well, would you want people uh, to copy and follow closely what you're doing in your Christian life? I confess before you, I'm not sure that I would. Because I'd be scared that you'd find me to be a, a hypocrite, a Pharisee. Remember Jesus spoke about the Pharisees? And he said to the, the people, he said, well, do what the Pharisees say, but don't do what the Pharisees do. That's my, trans that's my kind of transliteration of, of what Jesus said there. And, and that would be the danger, wouldn't it? That what we say and what we do wouldn't match up. But nonetheless, it ought to be a motivation for us to live that godly, holy lives because people look at us and there will be some that will follow us uh, and perhaps there will be some that will be looking to see faults to, to, to hurl uh, against the church. But one of the things I've noticed over the years that people automatically have certain, well, I was going to call them spiritual heroes. I'm not sure I want to use that phrase. Let's call it like this. Uh, mentors, spiritual mentors, people that they look up to, people that have been a blessing to them, people that have been a guide to them in their uh, Christian life. Now, it might be a pastor, it might be a, a, a well-known uh, preacher, it might, be a, a, it might be somebody from the past. I remember somebody telling, telling me once that uh, his uh, spiritual mentors were all on his book, bookshelves. Um, and there are certain Christians and certain people that we do look up to, and we see them as examples and guides to us. And that is what Paul is doing here, isn't he? He's saying to the church at Philippi, follow me as I follow Christ. He's not putting himself forward as their saviour, but he's simply the mentor. He's simply pointing to Jesus. And as I seek to follow Christ, says Paul, then follow me as I seek to follow Christ. Well, if we have true spiritual mentors, they ought to be examples to us of how they are following the Lord Jesus Christ as well. The, a spiritual mentor that's good for us is one that will always be pointing to Jesus. I remember reading uh, John Piper uh, some, some years back. And uh, John Piper, who's a, a well-known, um, was, well, was, well, he still is alive, but uh, he's now retired, but he was a well-known pastor and conference speaker, and he's written hundreds of books. Um, but John Piper, uh, uh, one of his uh, books, uh, tells us that uh, as a, a Bible college student, he was encouraged by one of the lecturers uh, to uh, pick uh, a certain uh, spiritual, uh, godly person from church history and have that person be his mentor. Well, John Piper picked Jonathan Edwards. I think practically every book that you ever read of John Piper Jonathan Edwards must have co-written half of it somehow. Jonathan Edwards, a man who was uh, used in, in, in revival, uh, in the Great Awakening, as it's called, in New England. Uh, he was uh, contemporary and knew uh, George Whitfield, for example, at the same time as the Wesley brothers. Uh, and from Jonathan Edwards, John Piper said that Jonathan Edwards taught him so much more of the depth of Christ in the Scriptures. 
and he, spoke, he speaks of jo Jonathan Edwards as, his being, as being his mentor. Martin Luther and John Calvin, uh, in their day, uh, there, weren't, there weren't many good spiritual mentors around. <laughs> in fact, there were none, I don't think. But they did have a spiritual mentor. If you read John Calvin, if you read uh, Martin Luther, you discover that they immersed themselves in the writings of Augustine. He was their spiritual mentor. And these spiritual mentors were always doing the same thing. They weren't promoting themselves. They were pointing to Jesus. And this is what the Philippian believers were being told by Paul. Paul was their founding pastor. Paul is their mentor. But Paul is seeking only to point uh, to Jesus. Now, why I'm saying that is this that we are all part of a chain. Whether we realize it or not, we are all part of a chain. And in a way, we are all mentors to others. We're all examples to others, uh, and hopefully for others to follow Christ. Well, hopefully we're not bad examples. Prayerfully, we, we are good examples. But as believers in Jesus, we should always be seeking to point uh, to Jesus. And that's frightening when you think about it. Because I think most of us would say, well, not a very good example. And, uh, but it's also motivating, isn't it? Because if we are an example to others about living the Christian life and pointing to Jesus, then we've got to make sure we do live the Christian life and we do point to Jesus. Perhaps we need to be asking what kind of Christ am I pointing to in my life, in my Christian life? Well, I pray it will be the real Jesus. It will be the biblical Jesus. The Jesus of his word rather than a Jesus of my imagination or people's imagination. And in order to point people to Jesus, in order to live lives and examples to others of following Jesus, well, we get back to verse 8, don't we? We need to meditate on these things. And then the God of peace will be with you, Paul tells us, and we can say that the, the peace of God will be in us as well. So I want to leave you with that seventh verse while we finish. Then the God of peace will be with you, and the peace of God will be in you. That's what I, that's what I said. Let's see what the Bible says. There we are. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's what we want, don't we, in our lives. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guiding our hearts, guarding our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, uh, we ask then uh, your blessing upon us. Lord, we who are your children, we who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are examples to the world of what it means to be a Christian, of someone who loves Jesus. And we ask your forgiveness, Lord, when there are times where we're not very good examples, and we don't really honor the Lord Jesus Christ as we should. We would ask and pray for God the Holy Spirit to work in us and for your word to be speaking greatly into our souls that we might be better examples of how to live that Christian life and be those people of, for Jesus. Lord, we ask and pray that you would help us to meditate upon your word and, though, and all those things which Paul has mentioned that we should meditate upon true things and pure things and uh, all the other things that he talks about and Lord there's so much that we can meditate upon that will do us good but Lord help us to do good to others so that as 
we seek to be examples of what it means to love Jesus. Lord, may that example also be something that will encourage and, 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 and motivate and bless others as they see us uh, walking with Christ. Oh, Lord, we want to see your church strengthened. We want to see your people growing. We want to uh, see, again, uh, the gospel being proclaimed in all the power of the Holy Spirit and, and see souls saved. Oh, Lord, we pray that. We, we thought about uh, Thomas Charles there in Bala, an isolated place, Lord, but the Spirit came down and in, in mighty ways. And Lord, we need the Spirit to come down in mighty ways in this part of the world too. Because Lord, there are so many people living around us who have no idea who Jesus is and no understanding of the gospel. And the world is in such ignorance. But we have the truth, Lord. And help us to ponder on that truth and to preach that truth and proclaim that truth and to tell people that the truth is Jesus. And that in Jesus and only through Jesus is eternal life. And so we pray these things then in his name, in the name of Jesus. Amen.